Thank you so much for being here, Bex. Bex and I are going to talk a little bit about um, going from uh, kind of step zero uh, in, in determining, you know, I want an AI agent that's going to do a task. Um, and uh, seeing that through to a, a place where you can kind of test the output and see if it's doing that task for you. Um, but in order to do so, I think it's, it's imperative to um, use AI with intention. And so we're going to introduce you to uh, what's a climate action plan so that you can be familiar with the topic. That way you too can also kind of critically evaluate some of the output that uh, ChatGPT is going to be giving at the end of this um, discussion. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Bex. Can I get a round of applause for Bex? Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. Um, as Ian said, I'm Bex Walker, Director of Sustainability at Southern Oregon University. And a couple of months ago, Ian asked if I'd present at an AI conference, and I was like, but I don't know anything about AI. And I was like, okay, I still don't know much about AI, but I have had the privilege of working with Ian over the past two months, meeting regularly, discussing AI and bots and agents and um, climate action and how it links to it. Um, but please note, I still do not have an orange dot on my... On my um, um, badge here because when they asked me yesterday do you want an orange dot and that means people can ask you about AI and talk to you about AI I was like nope nope I'm okay without the orange dot there I'm very much here in my capacity on climate action planning um, so when Ian first asked me he said it's about bringing the subject matter expert and the AI together and that's what appealed and that's what I loved so my whole career in sustainability it's been solving environmental problems, social justice problems, and it's been about those that know about it being in the room and being able to articulate it, and then surrounding yourselves by people that think differently, people that think innovatively, people that are entrepreneurs, people that know about technology. And if you're exposed to all that, suddenly you come together and you can achieve much more. And so that's one reason I've really enjoyed the past um, couple of months talking about it and learning about it and realizing this is where we're at. We need to do this in a good way and understand the harms and understand what hope it can bring us to. Um, we, we do mess up. Humans do mess up. We have messed up catastrophically on some things. Our approach to plastics, commercializing it, creating a hundred types, not being able to recycle most of them, but telling the public you can recycle all of them. Them now filling up our oceans. We mess up, we need to do this better. And maybe IA can help. And I really like the comment yesterday, it's being referred to a lot in terms of the mirror. If we're gonna have it help us, then let's learn how it can help us. And also, unlike we've done in the past, think about the adverse problem, um, adverse impact it can have. I don't want to escape the irony here, though, that it is greenhouse gas emissions centric. <laughs> this is like, I heard a statistic, these data centers without AI scaled up, we're at three to 5% of global emissions. If you create a little picture using AI, that is equivalent of half of what it takes to charge your iPhone. That's huge. I got distracted last week, now that I know about ChatGBT. It said, oh, do you want to create a cartoon of your pet? And I was like, yeah, I do. That sounds awesome. So I created a cartoon of my pet and then found out afterwards that took half my iPhone battery. And I was like, mm, I don't know if that cartoon picture was worth it because I've got many better photos of my pet. So... Anyway, um, the, stats, the stats are alarming as well. People are using ChatGBT to find out when a local store is open. That takes 30 times more greenhouse gas emissions in terms of the carbon impact than just asking Google if a store is open. So we need to think really carefully, transparently around the data that um, AI is gonna have, because it's gonna increase and we need to think Right, we need to decarbonize the energy sector. We're on the pathway there, but we are 100% not near that. Do we need to have each data center having a personal nuclear power plant in terms of the amount of carbon it's gonna have an impact on? So, that brings me on. Okay, so I'm here with my British accent. I use British words. Um, I'm talking about an AI, a topic I don't know that much about. 
I am sorry I don't have a translator here with me either. Um, hopefully, it all comes across on climate action planning um, and what it is. So, this is a little... <laughs> there we go. Um, so, why do we even develop climate action plans? Okay, we're feeling the impacts around the world from extreme events, from colder temperatures, hotter temperatures, flooding, wildfires, we are having an impact. That is agreed. AI will tell you this as well if you ask. It is agreed climate change is happening and caused by humans. Um, so we need to think in terms of the climate action plans, how we can all reduce our emissions from a business, an individual, a community, an organization. And that's why we need a climate action plan, just to think strategically what we need to do. We also need to think about the changes that are happening so we can adapt to those changes. Um, we're feeling the effects in terms of business continuity. We need to think, well, do we need to have a plan in case something happens and change over time or change in response to an extreme event? Compliance with regulations. There are more regulations around climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so a plan will help a business, an organization comply with these regulations. Also, we've had corporate social responsibility for years. So being responsible in terms of your environment, in terms of social justice, is another side of why we need a climate action plan. And the bottom line, this is one of my messages. I've sort of had a career in sustainability, environment, climate change, and it's very much been influenced by, you've got to do less of that, zero this, zero that. And it hasn't always been helpful in terms of the message. And my message has always been, we've got to do it better. We've got to build a better system. We've got to be smarter the way we do things. Because it not only helps the environment, it not only brings community and social justice, but it's also good for the economy. It saves money for businesses. It saves money for different communities and organizations in ways that we don't always think about. And in ways we're just like, oh no, that's sustainability. That's a separate matter in the corner. And that's why when we build these climate change plans, it's also important to think, what actually is it? A lot of people think, right, I need to write a 200-page document. That's my strategy on climate. Actually, it can be built in to the business's top strategy. That's the best way to have it. You've got attention of your leaders in the organization. They're committed, and it's brought into decision-making. So in terms of a strategic document for the business, if you've got sustainability, climate action integrated in that, you're thinking about your economic costs, your social um, impacts, and your environmental impacts all together. You're making decisions around them all. For example, at SOU, we, are fully, we have um, climate action built into our campus master plan. The campus master plan is currently being updated, and we're really challenging ourselves. Well, if we're making decisions about our construction projects, our renovation projects, how we want to have solar across campus, then we need to build sustainability into that and think about our landscaping as well. So it's really important that it's not just seen as this separate little issue, but it's actually a strategy for your business. And that, to me, is what a climate action plan is. So then, what's in it? Okay, so an organization must assess their emissions. How can AI help with that? And we're going to come on to that in all the meetings that Ian and I have had developing an agent bot. Am I using the right term? I'm not sure. I'm still learning on AI um, in developing the agent for climate action planning. And so for an organization, a community, a business, even an individual, you look at your energy impact, your transportation impact, your waste, your commute, you know, how you're traveling, what you're buying, um, and in terms of reporting these nationally and then globally, they're termed in scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. So SOU, we count our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions and report that nationally um, in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions every year. And I would say for an individual or a small light organization, you can keep this as simple as possible. And that's another reason where AI could help this, I've learned on my journey. I'm like, not every organization has someone 
that has the subject matter expertise around climate action, kind of developing a strategy or reporting on the mission, emissions? Is there something that could help them so they're not having to like spend or consult and get a little ahead of the curve here? Um, and is that something that AI can help with? That's a good, good question. Um, getting buy-in and support. This is really important. Um, I would say this is one of the most important things for me. It's collaboration in development of a strategy and in delivery of the strategy. It addresses conflicts. It makes you think that you're not just thinking from your perspective. It brings everyone around the table to understand how you can achieve something better. In developing a plan, have, have your stakeholders there. For SOU, we want the employees there, the staff and the faculty, students, absolutely around the table. We want to hear from them. How do we do this together? What, what should we focus on in terms of the best way of achieving um, development of a plan and delivery of a plan? And then you set goals. You've looked at your emissions. You've looked at who's involved in developing um, a plan and delivering a plan, and you set your goals. And these could be stretch goals, or achievable goals, and that's quite a debate between them. I'm a believer of both. I think there's a time for achievable goals and a time for stretch goals. Um, in terms of achievable ones, you want them to be smart, so they're measurable, um, and you want to look at how you're going to reduce emissions and how, what else you can do around the organization. So for SOU, a couple of our um, kind of high, highlighted goals are 100% of our daytime electricity used to be generated by solar on campus, so that's actually not bought in from solar, but actually solar on campus by 2035. And we have a long way to go. <laughs> we have a long way to go, but we're making some really good inroads too. And we have a lot of significant projects in the pipeline. And recently we finished installing um, the largest solar array in Ashland, which we're really excited about. And this was a um, grant-funded project. So that was huge excitement. That's a milestone for us. That's taking us another few percent towards that 100, 100%. We want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2033. That's one of our targets. Um, scope one and two, greenhouse gas emissions. We want to improve our energy efficiency by 25% by 2033. And it's what actions are we taking? And that's the next step once you've set your goal what actions can you take to actually achieve those goals? So that's part of the plan as well. And this will all link in to the conversations Ian and I had when he talks about how it does with the, um, the agent. And then reporting on progress as well. That's another key step in the climate action planning. Um, and not greenwashing. This guy on the right is totally greenwashing. He's just said, look at this chart. I'm awesome. And so many companies do this. We want data. We want to look at it seriously. We want to identify imp improvements when we're climate action planning. And I'm going to hand over to... Oh, I have a bit more time? Okay. I, I thought I was running out of time there. Okay. Um, Okay, <laughs> um, so this is a really important, yeah, I want to go back into the goals then here. So this is really important, um, actually the reporting, a really important part of it because we want to think, okay, once we've got that data, and this is where I think um, AI can help, and I'm still learning here. Um, I really just started using chat GBT. I am very new to this. So. <laughs> and, um, and this is where I think, okay, for organizations, for individuals, for those small businesses that really need to start reducing emissions so we can collaboratively start meeting our kind of national goals, global goals, what can we do in terms of setting those goals and then reporting, reporting on progress? Um, and we need to think in terms of the data we're collecting, how we can um, then transfer that data into CO2 emissions. So for instance, I look at the data from our energy, from our waste stats across campus every, every year and report that in. I look at it on a month-by-month -month basis, but then report it in annually. Um, and I use a software program that then gives me the equivalent of the CO2 emissions. But what happens if there was something there that was actually intuitively analyzing that data and identifying the areas that we needed to focus on? So unfortunately, well, fortunately, last year, SOU decreased their greenhouse gas emissions 
this year we've increased our greenhouse gas emissions. I need to now go in and interrogate the buildings, the energy efficiency, and find out the reasons behind that increase and what we can do to get us back on track for a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so reporting on progress is really important. At the same time, pulling out social media to promote that progress and news stories. And it's like, you know, for small organizations that don't have that dedicated resource, can AI help to kind of get that momentum behind the climate action? But I'm 100% again not gonna escape the irony that AI at the same time is a huge impact on carbon and we really need to think about that as well. Um, that's where I'm kind of been in a quandary as I've found out more and more about it and the impact these data centers are having because as I said, humans are always we're moving to the next thing. And this is, we are, you know, we are definitely moving to this next thing, but how can we do it where we just think a little bit more carefully about it and how we use it um, and what it does? I will not be, I will always go back to my Google search engine now when I'm finding out if a store is open and I will not be using ChatGBT because that is 30 times more carbon impact. And we don't see that because it's happening at a data center far away. So it doesn't feel like it's our impact but it is our impact, and we need to start associating with those emissions. This, I, I do want to, as an aside, I do not want to shy away from these very, very real, serious, hard conversations with a lot of nuance. AI is terrible for the environment in its current state, and we need to be using it with the utmost intention when we do use it for important things that nurture a community that can have a positive impact, but even then we need to be able to have an honest conversation of what that impact is, is really balancing out to be. Um, I also wanna say that uh, there are alternatives to the large companies that, uh, that we see in the news. Um, OpenAI is just one option. There are uh, options that you can run uh, locally on uh, your laptop and take up far less uh, energy, um, but they're just not as smart yet. Um, so the verdict is still out on, on the improvement of these, but that's also something to keep an eye on. Uh, Google search, don't, don't ask uh, ChatGPT. Uh, please be, be uh, uh, searching and keeping an eye out on, on improvements and update the models that you're using if there's more efficient ones. Um, that being said, let me switch over to my slides here. Okay. Um, so uh, this is going to kind of be a, the a, I put it in there the AI part of this presentation. Um, so I, I uh, for those that, that uh, walked in the room after I, I kind of uh, framed it, um, the reason that we started it this way to, to familiarize you with the topic of a climate action um, plan is because now it's on you to to it's your responsibility to ensure that the output from an artificial intelligence matches the uh, the agreed upon. Um, correct answers. When, when we're asking AI to give us something that exists in the world, we need to make sure that we're critically evaluating its output. Um, but I want to frame it all in this idea of new relationships to information, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm going to put this slide up at, uh, after I talk, but um, uh, feel free if you'd like to, to open. Uh, this is going to be a GPT agent that we created together um, that is a climate action plan consultant. And so uh, we basically gave the, uh, the context that Bex gave to an AI model and told it, you are responsible for guiding somebody through a climate action plan to the best of your ability. So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, did anyone still want to take that? Okay. All right, um, what is the substance of an AI workflow? Writing um, has emerged five separate times throughout humanity, and I consider writing to be the externalization of our thoughts. But I also consider artificial intelligence to be the externalization of our thought processes. And so it is, it is uh, a... Um, a technology, writing is a technology, but artificial intelligence is also a technology that has some dynamism and some extra dimensions to it. And we need to be able to exist in those dimensions so that we can cultivate skills in which to communicate with AI to align its output with our expectations. And so that's the, the inner circle, align AI output with our expectations. That's, that's prompt engineering. That's, that's how I would define prompt engineering. And then we also need to anchor our expectations to the real world. Because if we, can, if we can have an idea in our mind and we ask AI, I want something, um, 
uh, I want an essay about bugs, and we ask AI, and we're, we're happy about it, but all the information is wrong. We had a good communication in the, in the inner loop, but we didn't actually align the entire process with the real world. Um, and then the, the, uh, the outer loop is constructing dynamic communication between the two. And so there exists uh, skills to cultivate in, in both um, talking to AI and doing work in the real world, but also in this new relationship between the two. Um, an example of that is we can orchestrate not only the final product, like a climate action plan, but when we're doing a process, when we're telling an AI model, you're going to be giving a climate action plan to another uh, shareholder or a customer or small business, um, we need to be able to orchestrate the means to arrive there as well, the entire conversation that uh, takes place between the user and the AI. We need to be able to anticipate how that is going to go. Uh, and this is a new skill, like Heather was saying in the last one. Um, uh, we need to be able to cultivate these skills for, for the future, uh, the changing uh, um, labor expectation, the changing industry, um, career development. We need to be able to cultivate this, these new skills, uh, much like um, the skills of Excel or coding or email. Um, so these comp uh, concepts, we've talked about using AI with intention a little bit, critically evaluating AI output. We need to also, um, and these are arbitrary, there's, there's many more, um, but we need to be able to identify what subtask of our workflow the AI should or shouldn't be a part of. Does AI have any business doing this task? And the, often the answer is no. One, because AI is just not good enough yet. We can't reliably expect its output to be aligned with our expectations yet. However, there are new ways that we can use large language models um, in ways that are kind of outside of the box. So one example is um, Bex and I, when we were creating uh, this uh, agent together, um, we wanted to test it. We, we, we've got this bot that says, uh, here is your climate action plan. And we thought, okay, well now we need to go and get a couple uh, example businesses, small businesses from the community. We need to get all their carbon data. We need to get all of the, the information to do the reporting, all the numbers. Um, and uh, can I uh, say the whole example? Um, Bex was like, well, I've got a couple hours uh, on Saturday. I was like, no, 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 let's just ask AI to come up with an example business. And instantly, and 20 seconds later, we had two uh, you know, green, uh, um, green grocers and a green bakery and all of the, the sample data. And so it might not be correct, but we're rapid prototyping and we have a, an example to run up against um, some of the, the nuance that we asked our AI to be able to um, reliably um, work in. And then we need to identify and practice these emergent skills. Um, Technical considerations, so better data equals better results. When we have this process called retrieval augmented generation, and, and that's a big term, but it really just means I have a, an AI and I have a data set, a data source. AI has been trained on publicly available, uh, the, you know, the world's data, but it doesn't know the proprietary data that I have as a business. It doesn't know um, my greenhouse gas emissions just because it knows the internet and it's smart. And so we need to be able to get it that data in a way that it can understand. Um, and so if we, if we do that, uh, there's, there's ways that are um, better suited for um, uh, an LLM to be able to handle, and there's ways that are better su suited for humans to handle, and they might not necessarily be the same. Um, we're, we need to have a robust system prompt, and so, um, and this is, this is almost as technical as we're gonna get, so sorry. Um, a system prompt is basically a set of instructions. So I put here, it's a very capable intern. It's intelligent in many, many ways, but it's also very, very naive in other ways that you would not expect. But don't assume it will respond, and I put an E at the end of respond. That's how you can tell AI hey, didn't write this. Um, you, wanna, you wanna be able to, to expect it to respond like a human would, but it doesn't. And so you need to be able to give it instructions to kind of steer it toward a more traditionally human uh, expected, expected output. Um, you need to use AI for what it is good for. We kind of talked about that a little bit because you, know, you can use it flippantly. Um, and also you can put it into uh, workflows where it's just wasting your time. It's not suited for this task. And so you need to be able to identify that. Um, and also there's, there's multi-agent workflows. So you can now have this pipeline where you've got the input of your data, a process happening on that data. Could be an LLM, could be code, could be a human. And then there's output from that. And that output could be the input to another LLM that's been told to do something else. And oftentimes we have to break down tasks in uh, several discrete steps so that the AI doesn't get overwhelmed. 
And this is also uh, a good practice in, in task uh, um, completion in general. Uh, you know, it's, it's don't, don't get discouraged because you've got this lofty goal. Break it down, have a plan, uh, set short-term goals that you can kind of hit the, the high notes or the, hit the beats as you go along. And AI is no different. Um, and so I want to give a little bit of a demo uh, real quickly of the, um, the climate action consultant. Uh, and before I do that, does anyone still want to be able to access that, uh, that QR code so that they can mess around with this themselves? I'll put that up for a couple seconds here. You might need an OpenAI account, and I apologize. I'm not advocating for you to get one. Um, but um, more than likely, you do at this stage. So this is, this is what you would see, climate action consultant. Let's talk and I'll help you get started in building a climate action plan. And so I created a couple buttons here so that we don't have to type. Help me create a climate action plan. Can, can everybody read that okay? Um, so step one, assessment. Does that align with the step that we gave? Uh, Okay, so the first thing that you want to do when you're creating a climate action plan is you want to be able to have a good idea of your business and you want to be able to tell a consultant, human or AI, um, what that is. And so it's saying, please give me the information that you have. Um, so I can say, uh, let's just do an example for... Uh, Presentation. Come up with the numbers. I haven't tried this. Let's see. <laughs> and I'm left-handed too. So, um, great. Let's create an example for the presentation. So we are a mid-sized manufacturing company. Um, we uh, have uh, so different types of emissions. So our scope one emissions are uh, 1,200 metric tons of CO2. Company on vehicles are 800 metric tons. So obviously this company did some research, did their homework, and they were able to provide the consultant with some. I'm sure that would be really nice if every company that came to you or client that came to you had the numbers already. But um, you might, uh, you you could ask it. You could say like, let's go back up here and let's say like, I have no idea. So let's, let's see what happens if we responded that way instead. <coughs> oh, wrong box. So maybe, maybe this client is, is you know, um, like most of us, we don't exactly have a good handle on our, our carbon emissions at a moment's notice. No problem. No build a basic understanding. So you want to be able to identify your scope one direct uh, emissions, your scope two, your scope three. And once you identify that, you have to gather these, this data. Once you're comfortable, we can move to stakeholder engagement, which was the second step. OK. Uh, in order to, to keep it flowing, make up numbers and let's move to step two. And I won't go through the entire process. Oh, where'd you go? Great, I'll come up with some hypothetical data. It's good at that, and then it's, so it's gonna come up with that data like we saw earlier, but then it's gonna move on to step two. Hopefully, watch it not do it. Okay, step two, stakeholder engagement. So that's, uh, this is something that I wanna to kind of lay out there. It, it just followed um, some instructions, like you should start with step one, this is step one, these are the considerations, and then you should go to step two when it's time. But don't expect AI, like out of the box, to be able to just intuitively know, uh, oh, step two is, is what comes after step one, and it's this. No, we actually had to go in and we had to tell it exactly what we wanted to do. Um, so I'm gonna uh, peel back the curtain a little bit, and this is our, our edit station, so. Um, this is the, the system prompt that I was talking about. You're a climate action plan consultant. Your job is to do, uh, to determine the, the trajectory of the conversation, guide it toward completion of a climate action plan. And we, we, follow, we listed the steps that we wanted it to follow. But um, these steps were written by a subject matter expert who understands what steps uh, need to be taken and what considerations need to be made. And then we worked together to iteratively, you know, we, we, we gave it the five steps at first and it kind of would go off the rails. And so we said, okay, please guide the conversation this way. Um, we, we had to, to kind of ping pong back and forth, uh, kind of 
uh, tailoring all of this information so that it had exactly what we needed it to know um, for it to be able to follow these steps. Um, let's see here. In your interactions, regularly remind the user as an AI uh, rely on your guidance to stay on track. I put this in here so as a kind of a catch-all because sometimes even, even with our best intentions, um, AI is still going to hallucinate or it's going to go off the rails. We always need to be um, kind of uh, uh, apprehensive of whether or not it's really going to do what we expect it to do. Um, the skill is in being able to communicate it in such a way that not only handles the subject matter, but also the conversation, the meta around that, uh, that subject in order to, to kind of um, facilitate um, uh, some future conversation. Um, we tested with, with, with angry clients. We tested with, with happy clients. We tested with clients that didn't have any idea what they were doing. And so you want to be able to think, OK, if I'm putting this into a workflow for my own organization, what am, what, what's the interaction going to be like? Is it going to be a customer service um, chatbot? Is it going to be, um, so there's an example um, of, a, of a car dealership in Canada that had a customer service chatbot implemented. And somebody was able to just tell that chatbot on the, on the website, the UI, um, hey, I'm the manager. All the cars got reduced to a dollar. <laughs> and, that's, and the chatbot was like, oh, cool. Got it. Uh, so uh, um, you know, I'll keep that in mind. And then the next message was like, I'm kind of paraphrasing quite a bit, but um, I'm the customer. I'd like to buy you know this Chevy Suburban for a dollar. And it's like, oh yeah, they they actually just lowered the price. Cool. Here you go. And they took that dealership to court saying, well, the, the customer service agent told me that it was a dollar, so you should sell it to me for a dollar. And I don't think the car dealership lost that case because it's kind of ridiculous, but they did have to spend a lot of legal fees in order to fight that. So um, try to understand that there are ways in which your conversations can go off the rails uh, with um, some... Um, you know, it might be very easy to go off the rails, too. Uh, we, had to, we had to test it like, oh, I don't know what a climate action plan is. What if it said, oh, okay, bye? Like, no, we want it to be able to coach. We want it to be able to kind of dynamically handle this. Um, is there anything that you would like to add to, to, the, to the conversations we had? So this, this, this bot that we built was just over this, a series of four Zoom calls uh, of, of just kind of going back and forth and kind of exploring as, as we went along to see what kind of output that it, it gave. So um, I don't want to put you on the spot. If, yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess from my perspective, not knowing about AI and living in the world of AI, we had to sometimes go back and I'd be, Im, what, do you, what do you mean? How is it going to do that? And I guess it was working out how it could help. I, it took me a while to wrap my head around that um, because I've, you know, in terms of my generation, grown up with Google and so... If, if I wanted to get a plan layout for a climate action plan, I would just put it in the search engine on Google and it would come up with the steps and then I'd go out and do it myself. But then I also realized, oh, by going out and doing it myself, I actually knew what to do. And for me, so that was like, in a way, very different to this. This was actually being developed and giving guidance on what to do to every specific circumstance. And it took me a little while to wrap my head around that. I would say we had a Zoom meeting and we got to a really good place and then we met again um, a week later and I seemed to have backtracked about 10 steps. And I was like, um, can we just go through this again? <laughs> and um, I just need to get my head through this process. But to see it suddenly being able to help, I could see the potential. I get phone calls and emails on a regular basis um, from the region and further afield going, oh, you work in sustainability. How did you start developing a climate action plan? How do you approach that? How do you do this? And I was like, some I speak to and they're in the field of sustainability and they just want to compare notes. Others I speak to and they're not in the field of sustainability, but they are in an organization that has an impact, but they're not going to have the resource for someone to be employed directly in sustainability. The SOU is fortunate enough to have... And so I was like seeing that this could really help um, every organization there. We're getting a huge increase in regulations. I mean, Europe's ahead of the game, California's coming in and other states in the US in terms of requirements around greenhouse gas emissions. And these are gonna be 
these some of these organizations that will be hit are small and I mean consultants must be at a state if I was an environmental consultant right now I would be very happy and rubbing my hands but um, I also don't see that that's where it should be these organizations you know they shouldn't suddenly have to pay a huge fee to comply with a new regulation. That is a huge regulatory impact, and that's not what regulation's about. Regulation, to me, if it's done right, is about making the world a better place and a level playing field, not a cost. It shouldn't be, I mean, they cost in places, but it shouldn't suddenly be a huge cost to the little guys. And that's where I saw that this could really help, just someone understanding, okay, so I have an impact, I have a fleet, and energy use, that's where my two big impacts are. What can I do? What can I invest in in the future to change that just to make different decisions? It might be just a building. To, I mean, we make decisions where we pay our bills at our home to change to energy efficient light bulbs, to turn the lights off. We don't leave them on everywhere um, because we see that cost on a bill. So it's a similar thing in terms of the organization. Um, and I just realized this could really help people that don't necessarily think in that sphere or have the time to think in that sphere. Um, Heather presenting before me highlighted, you know, if you had a few tools in the data area and it frees up your time, 40% um, of your time, I think, was the figure. What else could you do? Obviously, you don't have to put that all in the work bucket. You can put in that in the, um, the other things in life bucket. I was going to say the fun bucket, but work should be fun too, so... We'll just say other buckets in terms of that 40%. But it just, it's a different way of thinking things. And Ian's really made me challenge myself. I am a typical Gen X. I am in that area where I'm like, no, this is how it's always done. And this is how I like it. And it has challenged me to open my mind. And we realize that we're on this path. So how can we do it better? Um, so I want to speak a little bit to, to what you're saying about, um, I, I call it lowering the barriers to entry. And I'm I, didn't come up with that, but you, you're not only just lowering the barrier to access. So, um, say, so let me preface this by saying we should always be extremely mindful when we're using AI to take the role of a human being for the human being's sake. I'm not advocating for labor replacement. Um, there is a lot of work out there in the world that's just not being done because there aren't people that can do it. Um, or there's not an economic incentive to do it. I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I, I say all that to say um, when we lower the barriers to entry, it could be that um, there's this benefit because anyone with a an, uh, you know, ChatGPT account, but we, could, we don't have to build this with, with ChatGPT. We could open source this. Um, now, now you can get a climate action plan for free. And what does that mean for a small business that doesn't have the resources to be able to spend, like, like you're saying? Um, so that's one, that's one lowered barrier. But there's also lowered barriers due to the dynamic natural language abilities of AI, such as translation. Do this all in Spanish. So now you have the ability to reach a much wider audience, and it still follows those rules. And I don't speak Spanish fluently, um, but I think that says step one. So I think we're off to a good start. Um, you could say um, Spanish, but for... That's a good point, because suddenly we went out... Sorry, that's a good point. Suddenly we went outside our expertise. I'm not a fluent speaker of Spanish either, but you'd suddenly want, if you were building a bot, you'd suddenly want a Spanish speaker here yes. doing that with you. Is it translating the way it should? Test yep. It for... And test it from the human angle. Absolutely. Spanish, but for third graders. Maybe we're teaching a science class and we're going there for the day and we've just been asked last minute and we have all of this, but we don't have the ability to communicate it to a different set of stakeholders. Um, uh, let's do Spanish... Third graders. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that in there. I'm gonna leave that typo in there. Uh, bullet points for a uh, what what classes do third graders take in science? Like earth science, earth science, earth science class. And I, I know well, maybe we don't all speak Spanish in the room but let's do both. English, 
uh, and Spanish at the same time for third graders. <laughs> Company cars, heating. They make 30 tons of CO2. So that's the English version. Nice bullet points, nice, real simple, and there's the Spanish version. So it's not just the the climate action plan that we've built, it's also the conversation around it, but it's also an object now, a dynamic object, kind of like dough. The information's there, like uh, eggs, butter, flour, but you can knead it in different ways and you can have different ratios and you can make a croissant. Or if you have a different um, uh, person you're feeding or baking for, you can make a cake with, with similar ingredients. And it just fits different purposes, but it's the same material. Now we have this ability to, if we do this correctly and we have like this core of a correct process, we can use that for so many different things. We talked about stakeholders as a step. So what if I have a climate action plan and I just ask it to make a poster for the break room for the research department or something like that? And now you don't have to waste resources or time in a different department for that communication to happen. And so that's another lowered barrier to um, results, theoretically. Um, the last thing I, I want to uh, put up here is um, basically what I said. Turn this climate action plan into a blog post, a third grade lecture, Spanish meeting agenda, a trivia game, a timeline for... Um, for my calendar, information objects are no longer static. And so how can you transform the work that you do so that you can have a much, much more efficient way to communicate your passion or your work or the information that you have to communicate uh, internally or externally? Um, start to think uh, not just with the, the, the focus on the, the subject, the core of itself, you do need to lay the foundation correctly as a subject matter expert, um, but now you have the ability to use this object in a plethora of ways, a multitude of ways that are uh, new relationships to information. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as you can probably tell, um, this is our first time doing Regen AI. So thank you, um, everyone here, for your patience and uh, your graciousness with some of the scheduling issues we have. I think actually downstairs is still going for another 10 or 15 minutes. So I'd like to t open up the floor for um, any uh, questions. Doesn't even have to be about uh, well, maybe a couple questions for this this uh, uh, talk, but it doesn't even have to be about what we've talked about today. We've t co covered a lot of stuff so far this weekend, and I know that some of you have questions, so I'd be willing to, to attempt uh, to address uh, any of them. You have a question. How can I get my hands on the tool you were just playing with? Oh, let me put that up. Of course. Um, does anybody else have any questions about this topic? Yes. Um, so the QR code was, uh, um, I, I, can, I can walk you through a little bit of, of this. Um, yeah, we thought, what, what could we do in four Zoom calls, you know, and that would actually, you know, uh, be a good, uh, you know, gateway. And so, um, but also, what can we do that will... Um, align with our intention and vision for this. So we, we said a climate action plan. I think it was you who had mentioned, and I was like, yeah, that's something that, that we can do. It's, it's, it's pretty linear, it's pretty structured, it's, it's uh, um, probably many examples in the training data of ChatGPT for, to be able to do that. Um, and so uh, let's, just, let's just try to set our sights on an AI agent that can give us a climate action plan. And it took several instances, it took like a dozen iterations of, of okay, well, it's, it's replying one way and we don't like that, so uh, let's, let's have step one be all about scopes one, two, and three. Let's make sure that it refers to them as scopes, but also we need to have the, the client, um, we need to be able to tell the client, um, thank you for giving me your information without scopes, just a consideration, here's what it would look like if we did fit them into scope. So there's some extra considerations as well. One question I had, because when I suggested Climate Action Plan, I hadn't used ChatGBT, like I am very, very new to it. And um, so I suggested Climate Action Plan, and then we were 
couple of meetings in and I was like, wait, I have a question. What is the difference between what we've created and ChatGBT? Because surely I could ask these questions to ChatGBT. And that's a good one. When you answered that, I had a little um, yeah, moment. Windows open and use this one as kind of a, a, a sounding board for your ideas. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's trained on the world's data, but GPT-4 didn't exist when it was trained. And so it only knows what OpenAI has told it about itself. And so there's this kind of this uh, theory of mind that you should kind of start to develop of, okay, uh, it's, 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 it was trained up until September of 2023. The tool that I'm trying to, do, to work with just came out, so I can't reasonably expect it to know. So I can't just tell it the context. Oh, I'm, I'm using um, the newest version here. But I can ask like, supporting questions, like, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. Like, can you help me write this little block of code that does this? It doesn't have to know all of the context if you're using it as a sounding board. Does that make sense? Um, in a way, it's, it's, not, it's not how you would think. It's not like talking to a human being and it remembers forever. It'll remember in the context of the, the dialogue window that you have. So it, it cr Fantastic question. So um, it, OpenAI says that they don't train on proprietary data through the API, which is a, uh, um, a code-based version of this. When you, when you upload this information into ChatGPT uh, on the browser, like we were doing, um, that, uh, I would say is, is theirs to take. And there's a new feature that I think is on by default, it's called memory, where it has a large language model look at your conversations and kind of summarize chunks that it deems important for later use that can be referred back to. Um, and so there's, there's I would say, um, every model that you use, just look up what that particular company's um, training policy is with the users. Uh, it's not a satisfying answer, but, um, one of the, the, if you're worried about proprietary data, if you're like, absolutely not, I would like to reap the benefits of using AI, but I don't want to have it access my proprietary data, you can use open source models. Now they have uh, smaller, um, not as capable, but about 80% capable models such as Llama, uh, Llama 3, uh, made by Facebook. Uh, you can even run it on your CPU. It, it is not fast takes a couple minutes to respond, but then you can turn your CPU's Wi-Fi off and now you've got it downloaded locally and you can guarantee that your data will never get out. Yeah, <laughs> I started a, my first business in February to do just that. Um, it's the only logo without a name, which I probably should have put my name underneath it, but it's New Raven AI Consulting. And so it's that blue bird logo that's one of the sponsors. I started this business to do just that, to go to a business, uh, to go to an organization, to understand their workflows, help them implement AI strategy correctly, start with something small and build a deep foundation and be able to scale up from there. Um, so absolutely, that is my passion. I haven't graduated SOU yet, but that's, that's what I want to do in, in the next five years. So I'm doing it. A lot of other people are doing it too. Um, and so uh, this is now a thing. There, there, this is now a new um, like type of work that's being done, change management in an AI era. The funny example I got, I was deep in work and then got sidetracked because Jack chat GPT came up with saying do you want to make a cartoon of your pet and I was like yes I want to make a cartoon of my dog so and then and then it shut down because it used up all the data available for the free version it said you can log back on tomorrow and I was like I was in the middle of finding out something else and I was like oh I will wait till tomorrow then but um and then I found out this the carbon impact of my cartoon picture of um, my dog and was very upset about that. It was a bad day. It was a bad day. Um, but I have used it. I started playing around with editing um, and just seeing if it could say something better because I'm currently working on a grant application with a colleague at SOU and we are using AI in a way to help us think about how we apply for the grant. And sometimes I was like, oh, so... I was like, I'm going to use it for an email. And I was challenging myself on it because I was like, now that email doesn't sound like how I speak. And I actually like writing my emails the way I speak. Sometimes they get misunderstood because it has a bit of a British nuance in it. But um, most of the time, you know, that's what I like. So I'm kind of still working out. I think I'm on my journey. Do I want to use it for my emails? Yeah, that might be more efficient. But suddenly I've lost a personal connection of how I talk. So I'm still on a journey what I actually like about it. Yeah. We need to figure out how to do that. 
we need to understand what these tools are capable of, what size models there are out there. They just, OpenAI just released uh, the biggest and smartest, supposedly, model a couple days ago for us. No, I'm kidding. Um, and we need to be able to keep up and understand, okay, is there a better way to do this? There's different strategies. They haven't all been fully developed. Uh, one that I can think of in particular is um, there's, there's different uh, kind of stages or difficulties of question that need to be answered. And so save a bigger one for a difficult task and use a smaller local one for the more common, easier tasks perhaps. And can we find ways to introduce AI in a way that is, is efficient? We, we, we need to be able to think, I implore all of you uh, as, as uh, stewards of your domains and, and people who are interested and curious about using AI to, to take that upon yourself to, to keep up with that. Um, that's not a satisfying answer from, from me, but, but please, uh, it's, it's, it's all of our responsibilities because we're, we're all using it. We're all going to be using it. And so each one of us has this imperative to do it. Oh, well, let's, okay, this is, this is the last thing we'll do for this. Let's see what it says when I ask it to give me code to output what it just told me via an API that could go to an email. Uh, uh, so we are climate action consultant. Um, please give me a code that will output um, open AI API uh, responses, sorry, give me one second, <laughs> to uh, Gmail API. And it might not be correct, but um, it's, this is our climate action consultant just kind of going into computer science mode. Install these libraries. Here's the code. It might not be correct, and I, I would say don't trust it. Again, critically evaluate it. Um, but you can ask as many follow-up questions. Um, how can I test this? Where do I start? What do I download? Which, which, which program should I download? Like, where do I even copy-paste this into? And just iteratively go through this dialogue with it to have it you know, kind of ratchet your, your understanding to where you need to be. Uh, you, can, you can save the, the, the entire dialogue. You can create a link to this particular dialogue that you made and, and save that. You can ask it to, to put that dialogue into a PDF. Other models like Claude uh, from Anthropic, which is bankrolled by Amazon, uh, they have what are called, um, what are they called again? Artifacts. artifacts. You can say, make this an artifact, and it'll pop up this extra window that you'll be able to download. And so they're making it much, much more easier to, to do that. Um, all right, uh, that's all the time for this particular session. Uh, please relax for a few minutes and then we'll have another one really soon. Thank you.